Scotland is at the centre of a rapidly expanding marine energy industry and is developing a whole new range of wave and tidal energy devices. These need to be tested either in the real sea or in model test facilities. So it's important that we understand how waves are generated in the sea and also how they can be faithfully reproduced. We're going to need every kind of renewable energy that we can get. The wind people are way ahead and they've now made their machines at last really very reliable indeed. Tidal stream is going to be the one after that and waves I think uh, after that and we've got at the moment to improve the reliability of the components that we're putting in. Before looking at how waves can be reproduced in a tank, we're going to take a whistle-stop tour of some of the new devices coming on stream. The first commercial wave power machine to feed energy into the grid was called Limpet. This was built into the rocks on the island of Isla. Wave action causes the water to rise and fall inside massive cylinders built into the structure compressing and decompressing the air above. This air then passes through turbines which generate the electricity. My name's Adam Young. I'm the site manager for Aquamarine Power here at the Billy Accrue Wave Energy Test Centre on Orkney. We're testing the Oyster technology which is located in 12 to 15 metres of water depth, approximately 500 metres offshore where that boat is located. The system behind us is the power takeoff system for the Oyster 800 wave energy converter. We take the high pressure water feed from the Oyster and we, we pass it through a conventional Pelton turbine behind you. And that's also linked to a flywheel and a generator. OK, now the flap from the Oyster gives a sort of pulsatile flow, is that correct? So is that a problem for this Pelton wheel turbine? You're correct, the flap moves according to the wave period. and. Um, the pulses from that are smoothed out by a series of accumulators offshore and onshore and we've also got a flywheel to maintain a constant shaft speed. And what sort of power will this unit generate? A um, single oyster flap is rated at 800 kilowatts. This drivetrain behind you is rated at 1.2 megawatts. I've come to Lioness on the Isle of Hoy to visit Palamis and I'm meeting up with Rob Ionides here. Rob, could you just explain what these units are behind you here? Yep, the two machines here are Palamas P2 wave energy generators. Um, they are maximum output of 750 kilowatts, uh, 180 meters long, and about four meters in diameter. I'm standing on the machine's joint. It's uh, basically where the power comes from. Um, the two tubes, one behind me, one in front of me, bend around this joint and push these rams in and out and that's where we get our power. We're inside the power takeoff module. Up above me is one of the four rams that we have inside each module of the machine. That squeezes the oil, pumps it into a hydraulic accumulator and we then let that oil out at a steady rate through hydraulic motors down below me and they spin these electrical generators. These accumulators allow us to smooth out the power that we produce. Um, when the waves come, we get a big burst of energy. And these, a bit like the shock absorbers in a car, smooth out those peaks and troughs in power. I'm at Seatricity in Stromness, and I've come to look at their wave energy system, which is one of the most recent innovations in Scotland. And Richard Tillerson here is the production manager. Richard, could you explain briefly how this system works? Yeah, certainly. Um, basically, it's uh, an oversized bicycle pump. So this is the pump we're looking at here. This will be sitting vertically. It's uh, anchored to, to the seabed with a 35-ton concrete block. And this end is tethered to a float, uh, which we'll go out and have a look at outside in a moment, uh, which travels vertically with the wave action and produces um, power via high pressure water which is then transmitted ashore via pipeline through a turbine 
and uh, eventually into a generator to produce electricity. Okay, these are the um, flotation units we talked about earlier. Uh, lots of people ask why the, this particular shape. Um, in fact, it's so they can go below the waves in um, heavy weather conditions and uh, take the crushing force. The waves behind me here in the sea are actually generated by the wind. And the height of the wave depends on the distance over which the wind blows in order to build up the waves, known as the fetch. Now, today, we're on the east coast and the wind is blowing from the west, so the waves are very, very small. When the wind is strong and it's blowing from the east, then the waves are much larger. When you look at the actual shape of the waves, you see it's extremely complex. They're actually made up of a whole range of different wavelengths. Complex waves and even breaking waves can be generated in a long channel or flume using a single wave paddle. I'm going to demonstrate now how waves are generated in a wave flume. I'll put in first a single frequency wave or frequency one hertz, that is I'll move the paddle at a rate of one cycle a second. Now the paddle's moving now, you'll see it actually takes a few seconds for the waves to move down the flume and reach me here at this point. And the speed at which this group is moving down the flume is referred to as the group velocity. Now waves have reached me now and if you fix your eye on the crest of one of the waves and look how quickly this is moving, the speed of the crest of the wave is referred to as the wave celerity. Now actually, in the deep ocean, the group velocity is only equal to half of the celerity. Now I'll just stop that now, and I'll put in um, a range of waves. In the real sea, you've got a whole range of different frequencies. So the high frequencies have a relatively short wavelength and these actually move quite slowly. The lower frequencies have a longer wavelength and move much more quickly. And if we superimpose um, a pattern of frequencies then we get a realistic sea condition. The pattern I've put in here is referred to as a John swap spectrum. I could have put in another pattern for example, I could have put in a pearson moscovitz spectrum. Now, again, in the real sea, you often get breaking waves. And again, I can illustrate that here. If we start the paddle moving quite quickly, then these high frequency waves will move quite slowly down the tank and once the paddle has been moving for a little bit we'll slow it down to generate these longer faster moving waves and um, this has been programmed here so that these waves all catch up at a point which is just in front of me here and the wave becomes so high at this point that it'll topple over and break. There we are, you've got a, a breaker at this position. If we want to generate more realistic three-dimensional seas, then we need to have a much wider tank and a whole series of wave paddles independently controlled. I'm stood here in front of the flow wave building at the University of Edinburgh and this is a new wave tank that we've recently completed and it's probably the most sophisticated wave tank in the world. Inside the tank we can combine waves and currents from any direction and that's a completely unique facility. 
and we can generate conditions at scales of about 1 to 20th scale that mimic the wave con con current conditions found anywhere uh, around the coast of the UK or indeed anywhere in Europe. And this is a valuable testing facility where developers can test machines under very controlled conditions and to understand what happens to them when they're generally working to generate energy or indeed when they're operating under survival conditions. I'm in the flow wave tank. I'd like to introduce you to Matthew Ray, who's director of Edinburgh Designs, who are making the wave makers for this facility. Matthew, could you tell us a little bit about the wave makers? Yes, of course. This is a unique facility in that we have put got wave makers that go all 360 degrees round the tank. So in total, we have 168 wave machines, identical wave machines like this, and they all they go all the way round. They act on the water in front and then there's a dry passageway which we can walk through to maintain and look after the machines. In the middle of the tank we've got a series of current generators which can generate current from any direction. We can either go from north to south or east to west or change dynamically as we progress through the experiment. We're now here at the base of the tank. Now imagine that there's going to be a big floor that separates the top part of the tank from the lower part of the tank. Water is moved from the top part to the bottom part by these big ducts and there's 28 of them in a circle all the way around the tank. So we've got a big propeller here that we draw the water in. The water comes down here and is turned through this turning vein and then up introduced below the wave makers and back into the top section. Okay, so I'm standing in front of the completely filled Flowwave wave tank. Uh, it took about four weeks to put 2.4 million litres of water in there, 2,400 tonnes. And we're just about to start testing the wave maker system uh, and get that ready and commissioned. I'm now programming up a single frequency long crested wave moving from right to left across the tank. I can then change this to a higher frequency long crested wave moving diagonally across the tank. More realistic random sea conditions can be generated by combining many different frequencies travelling in different directions. Currents can also be generated in any direction across the tank. To demonstrate the control we have over the tank, I will now focus the waves into the centre of the tank into a singularity, which will create a large spike. Mm -hmm. 